Tell us a little bit about that foundation and tell us how you arrived at that foundation. You know, for anybody listening, if yeah. you're thinking about starting any business or even a boutique creative agency, <laughs> what was that foundation you thought about before you even before you even went out and looked for that first client? Mm -hmm. What did you think about building that foundation? Well, I mean, I think a lot of it is thought work. So, you know, it's really like taking the time to sit down with yourself and a notebook and thinking through, you know, who do I want to do work for? And what do I want? How do I want them to see, see the agency that they're, you know, hiring? So I think for me, since it was me um, by myself for a long time, mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of that was really, you know, my values and things that were that mattered to me that I wanted to make sure came across. You know, I, I always want integrity to be a big part of what I do. I want people to trust me. And I, I don't think you can be in business with people if they don't trust you, or at least you won't be in business with them very long. So, um, you know, that was a big one for me. I wanted to make sure that um, I was able to, like, handle the work that was coming in too. So like I was allowing it to kind of the agency to grow organically and not, um, you know, not trying to force things in there, you know, that we would be able to, to take on the work and do it well. And I, I never want to send anything out in the world that I'm not proud of, or at least can't stand behind. Um, and so I think, yeah, it's a lot of thought work. It's really like getting into yourself and learning, you know, what's important to you as a person and, and how that can translate into your company. Um, because if you can't stand behind it, you can't ask other people to. So Yeah, that's fantastic because you're going to have a brand. You're going to have yeah. a culture that mm -hmm. your customers and the community and the industry knows about. For sure. And whether it's the one you want or not, yeah. <laughs> if you don't do that upfront thought work, mm -hmm it becomes whatever it defaults to with either how you, how your customers work with you, your clients yeah. work with you and your employees interact as well. So, yeah. so that's great. Um, that's not something you hear about a lot. Someone taking the time <laughs> and care to think all that through and to be prepared for that workload and workflow to really give clients all that attention that they really need. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people talk about it, but I do think a lot of people are doing it. So like, um, or at least trying to do it. So, you know, successful companies, I think have to have done that at least, subconsciously, right? Because they're setting up cultures that people want to work for, that people want to work with. Um, yeah, I, I find that companies hit a point where they go, oh, we need to be really conscious <laughs> about this now. They, yeah. um, we all, and I know it was my experience too, I'm just gonna get out there and do it. Yeah. And then I hit a point if I need to be really conscious about the brand, I need to be really conscious about the kind of clients I wanna work sure. with. And then, so that's almost like a new beginning of the company. Yeah, for sure. And I think you learn some of that stuff as you go too. Like I definitely, you know, I jumped in both feet in, like I wasn't, you know, I didn't know everything. Like I said, like mm -hmm. business was not something that I went to school for, you know, I went to a, an art school for design. So, um, you know, you learn some of that as you go and you, you know, hire people to help you. You know, I, you and I had a lot of conversations and a lot of, you know, coaching to, to help with some of those things. Um, and I think especially, yeah, like just learning how to even like things like, you know, the time management and figuring out how to um, just like doing some of the budgeting things like those weren't things. They sound like I don't want to say small things, but they, they don't sound like huge things in the grand scope of everything. But they make such a big difference when you're trying to figure out how to run so many things at once. And I had to I was trying to balance two at the same time. So were. I'm trying to build this thing up on my own. But he's already done a lot of launching programs and he's got staff and so forth. So uh, he and I have been talking about partnering up lately. That's my new model approach. You know, that's the way it is with startups, right? You're right. always pivoting. If you see a different way to get there, the idea is just to get there. No matter what you do, yeah. you're always trying to figure out what's the fastest way. So that's fantastic. It's a perfect lead in. What's the there? Where are we taking mm. laser tag fitness right. over the next 12 months, 24 months, five years? What's What's the plan for world domination? Yeah, nice. So I'm following the kind of standard startup entrepreneurial model, right? First thing I did was an MVP. I just wanted to see if this would even work. I got some equipment. We went out to, I made a deal with the city of Las Vegas, used their outdoor football fields and uh, just proved that it's a workout, right? Uh, measured heart rate. We counted uh, 12 calories per minute which is you know, mm -hmm. right up there with, yeah. with rowing and some of the most intense workouts that you can do. So the MVP was a success. Then I went for the minimally marketable product, so just to prove people are willing to pay. 
One is organizational structure. I think there's a lot of organizations that can learn from the military and how to implement communication and leadership structure into their organizations. But more important than that, and it's something that really has played a strong, significant value in my life, is values and, and really understanding how if you have a strong set of core values, that can be, be a magnet for people to come to you, or but it can also repel people away that don't believe in the same things that you believe. Um, there's a lot of playful banter between all the military branches. Mm -hmm. Again, this is before I got into like a lot of personal development that mm -hmm. comes with the DJ business. And I, I know we'll get to that, but like, I was just a worker bee. Like uh, when I ran the, the, the youth Academy, I was like the highest ranking person on, on the grounds, normally in charge of like 200 kids, but it was a very high stress, high impact. Like every, every time my, my radio went off, it was normally a fight or a kid wanting to quit. It was always the, these crisis decisions. What was beautiful about the electric thing was I had taken one class for that whenever I was in high school, but it was a way that I could just go release and just, uh, I did have a, my boombox from the Marine Corps. <laughs> I would play music and I would like, you know, get a whole crew pumped up and we would go wire houses or we'd wire commercial, residential, whatever, uh, a lot of industrial stuff. And it was just a place where I could listen to music and just think and get the job done. And I didn't have to make any big decisions. It was like, hey, here's all the stuff you need to wire this job. You got two days, get it done. And it was just a paycheck. But it, the funny thing is, uh, to answer your question, it was, uh, it was networking. There was a guy that was on our, on our crew and he said, dude, you're so much fun and you have so much passion. You don't want to do this for the rest of your life. He goes, I have this friend. He owns a DJ business. You should go talk to him. And when I went and met Jason Bailey, um, I had no idea what I was in, in store for, but that guy changed my life. He's the first person that like put a book in my hand mm -hmm. and said, and I, when I walked into their company culture, uh, DJ connection at the time was like the largest DJ business in the state of Oklahoma. They dominated Tulsa, Oklahoma city. And when I walked into the environment, it was like all these guys in suits but it was like all this fun, crazy stuff hanging up all over the wall. Everybody's on the phone. Everybody's energetic. There's people doing like, you know, big claps and all that stuff mm -hmm. like during phone calls. And I'm like, what is this place? Um, and in short, the poetic, it, it, this is entrepreneurship. Like this is the heart of it. And that's where I just got hooked. And uh, little would I know that everything that I learned from being a drill instructor or from being in the Marine Corps, um, I didn't understand how much that would carry over mm -hmm. into the wedding industry. Now, it's not a shot at like club DJs and stuff like that. But, you know, if I were a club DJ, I probably would have gotten fights because just when people come up like, I'm, you know, I, li I like running the show. I like being organized. I like doing that. And it just that's one thing that comes in in handy for not only planning weddings, but executing weddings uh, and all that stuff. It's like seeing the problem before it happens and just being ahead of it. Well, and one of the cool things about being a wedding DJ, well, when you're a club DJ, you're a club DJ, yep. night in, night out, yep. different crowd, but all looking for the same thing. When you're a wedding DJ, yeah. you are making the most important night of two people's lives yep. the most special night they're ever going to have. I yep. mean, that's, there's a lot of a lot of satisfaction that can come with that besides the money. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, that's what the purpose was for a long time. And it's like, I, I get to be a part of this, but now as I sit back and I look through all the photos and I see all the videos and like, I look at what I have and how important that is for me, I have a front row seat to love every weekend. And I get to see the, that's going to be the title the of your of book. That. Yeah. <laughs> front, row front row seat, seat to, to love. love. Now I think that, so where that delegation comes in is having an even more crystal clear vision of where I think we deserve to be. And then saying, here are some of the things that we need. And what I've been fascinated by is that there's so many people that are willing to raise their hand or they know the exact person that they can introduce me to mm -hmm. that would love to, to step on board. So that's been one thing. Uh, one of the most challenging things that I see for, for young, especially veteran entrepreneurs, cause that's who comes yeah. through our cohorts is a lot of times, like we give them this platform and this stage when they graduate to say, what do you need? And they'll say, you know, I just, you know, follow our social media and just, mm -hmm. we'd love your support. And it's like, no, you need an introduction to the director of mm -hmm. operations at MGM 
because your product or service has to do with that. Mm -hmm. Like that's what you need to ask for. And if you ask the right, like for the right thing, people raise their hand and be like, Oh my gosh, you need to. And I, I say that because there's been a lot of times where people have asked that and I've been introduced to those people. Mm -hmm. And, and when I meet somebody and this isn't, an ego thing. It's like, I'm fascinated by how many people I met during global entrepreneurship week yeah. that were like, are you Dave Berlin? Four people have told me this week that I'm supposed to meet you. And then they tell me why I'm and surprised I'm, it was only four. And I'm like, here, here's, here's who you need to call. Here's where you need to go. Here's what you need to do. And just amazing things starts to take shape from that. So 